Hello everyone and welcome to the session. We are going to talk about text mining and an LP, natural language processing. Within text analytics, I should say that you'll have two things. One is text mining, another is NLP. When it comes to text mining, you'd be least bothered about the sequence in which the words appear. And when it comes to natural language processing, when you talk in a natural manner, of course, when you talk, it is natural, right? It's not uh, a robot talking. It's a human talking, so it is natural. In natural language processing, the sequence in which the words appear matters. Okay, having said that, when it comes to various data types that one has to be aware of while analyzing includes structured data and unstructured data. When it comes to st structured data, we have tabular data, which is also called as columnar data. You would have data in a nice database. Within a database, database, the place where data is based is called as a database, right? Within this database, you will have tables. And within those tables, you'll have data. And you'll have rows and columns. Okay, rows and columns. This kind of data is called as tabular data or columnar data. Usually, the, the this kind of data is stored in something called as relational database management system. Why is it called as relational? Because you might have one table in which you might have data pertaining to employees working in that company, HR database. Right. You might have another table in which you might have data pertaining to finance department. What are the salaries we are paying? What is the GST we are paying? What is the professional tax? What is the, uh, you know, mm, PF, Provident Fund, so on and so forth. There'll be another table. If I can establish a relation between the employee database in which I have details of all the employees, and if I can establish, uh, I mean, the relation to another database, which is finance database, then it's called as a relational database. You can establish the relations between multiple tables, between different columns, so on and so forth. Hence, it is called as RDBMS, right? You will have open source databases, and you will have licensed databases. Open source, the, the most famous is MySQL. Okay, you also have something called as PostgreSQL. A few people call this as PostgreSQL. A few people call it as PostgreSQL, so on and so forth. And then you have Microsoft database. You have Oracle database, right? All these are commercialized. You need to pay the license and then use it. And you also have cloud-based databases. You have AWS-based databases. Then you have Azure, Microsoft-related uh, databases. You have GCP, Google Cloud Platform-related databases. In that way, you have a lot of databases. And on the other side, you have unstructured data, such as videos, images, Videos are nothing but culmination or combination of multiple images. If you take a lot of images, if you keep clicking photos one after another, and then if you merge all of those and quickly view all of those, it appears as a video in short. Right. Then you'll have audio files, then textual data. These unstructured data sources uh, or uh, yep, data which come from different data sources, you store them in 
no sql database usual like you have mongodb cassandra hbase etc is stored in that and majority of the unstructured data is in textual format okay to apply any algorithm any machine learning algorithm on unstructured data you cannot directly apply you need to convert this unstructured data into structured format only then can you apply any of the machine learning algorithms or statistical techniques on your data right so ultimately whatever unstructured data you have you need to convert that into a structured format and then you need to supply this to your machine learning algorithms or statistical techniques to analyze the data further so now let's proceed further why do people need textual data and what are the various sources from where textual data is generated you have social media facebook comments twitter tweets sina weibo is a chinese i you know twitter equivalent i should say you have a lot of microblogs tumblr is more or less gone for now but then that also has blogs news articles comments on the blogs the products that you purchase on amazon or flipkart or any of the e-commerce portal you leave your comment feedbacks some literature if you have tons and tons of documents you would probably not have time to read each document for example in uh, the indian context there are a lot of cases which are piled up when it comes to judiciary and uh, they cannot take a wrong decision of putting a right person behind bar so they'll have to thoroughly read all the documents and then give justice and uh, as opposed to reading tons and tons of documents can i not do text mining can i not extract the key insights can i not work on that absolutely you can okay so that's another thing then emails that you get i i would talk about one example here when it comes to emails for a specific customer which is now acquired by hp enterprise hpe right in noida we back in about 2017 i was there in noida to deliver the corporate training for this particular company which was then acquired by hp enterprise so they had a service desk team this team had access to microsoft outlook microsoft outlook like you have your gmail microsoft has something called as outlook you can access your emails you can schedule calendar invite so on and so forth this service the team members had a common email id on which customers would send emails they would say that you know what my credit card is not working my credit card transaction i didn't do that yet money got deducted you charged me late fee for no reason you put additional interest amount for no reason um my bank bank password net banking password is not working bunch of email they would get if they can resolve they would resolve if not this service desk team would then assign that particular email to the right resolver group if there is an issue pertaining to credit card they would assign it to credit card department if there is an issue pertaining to net banking they would assign it to net banking department so on and so forth this was their job if they can solve they will solve first level tickets incidents issues they need to resolve if they cannot they assign it to the next level that's called as level 2 or level 3 support and um they had a ticketing tool which is called as it service management tool which was service now no service now this is a tool wherein the service desk people would record uh, each email if there is an issue pertaining to credit card pin number 
someone says that, hey, I forgot the credit card pin number. They would raise that particular incident in this IT service management tool. They would copy that query of the customer. They would put it here. And they will also assign the right priority. If that email is coming from CEO of a big company, then they might want to resolve it immediately. So they will raise it as, as priority one. If a lot of people are sending emails pertaining to credit card pin number or credit card not working, that means a significant proportion of customer base is negatively impacted. So they increase the priority to priority one. Probably in 30 minutes, they have to resolve that in that way. Right? And they will also select the right resolver group. Should we assign it to credit card department? Should we assign it to loan department? Should we assign it to net banking department in that way? They would then assign it to the right resolver group. But this was done manually. So what we have done is all these emails would get saved in a file called as .pst file. If I'm not mistaken. Um, like you have .csv, .xlsx, .pdf, .txt, .pst is one format. These files would be residing on the server. Server from Microsoft is called as Microsoft Exchange. That's the name that they have given for the server. This is a client. Microsoft Outlook is a client. Server client architecture is what we call this. Out. People would be able to send emails, receive emails, but when they send email, it will go to the server from there to the right person. And all these emails would reside in this. So what we thought is, okay, let's take these files and let's automate this process. This file will contain what? Emails, emails contain textual data. I am unable to use my credit card for doing online transactions. That's text. So all the text would reside here. We would we have taken the textual data and we have done text mining on that. Mining, like coal mining or gold mining or diamond mining, you have text mining wherein you extract the text. And using that, we have automatically, by removing the dependency of humans here, we've automatically started creating the incidents in ServiceNow tool. That's one of the applications, friends. Okay. So there are plethora, plethora of, you know, such opportunities. It's just that you need to think on what kind of opportunities exist. Medical records contain description of the diseases that you have. Uh, sorry, symptoms that you have based on that, what diseases you have based on that, what medicines doctor prescribes and what quantity you need to take. All that would be there in the medical record also. And uh, that usually, if, if an insurance company is involved, if you're claiming medical insurance, these records is what insurance company would analyze. Rather than manually reading each and every uh, PDF document or the medical record, you can scan it. You can extract the right portion, right? You can extract only the name of the patient. You can extract only the name of the hospital. You can extract only the names of the diseases, which is called as condition in medical term. You can extract only the names of the drugs, which is called as intervention. You can extract only these using text mining. So in this way, you can do a lot of things, friends, the moment you have textual data. These are all the various sources from where you get the data. And um, one of a friend by name, uh, by name Abhinav, he is now working as vice president uh, for risk analytics in Citibank, Texas, right? 
and uh, he has worked on one of the judiciary related uh, project wherein our students also were involved along with him uh, there are bunch of uh, you know legal documents analyzing those legal documents extracting the important information from that giving to the judges so that judges take informed and quick decisions was part of that project and to accomplish these kind of things you have a lot of python libraries libraries contain code which someone else has already written you just need to reuse that you need to understand which one you need to use and you need to reuse that to be able to accomplish your task we have something called as nltk which is natural language toolkit then you have text blob then you have uh, weda valence survey dictionary and sentiment reasoner uh, which which is used to extract the you know key insights and emotions from the data you have request which is used to scrape the data from urls you have beautiful soup which is used to um, extract the data from the html once again right so anyways so here is the agenda we briefly understood the importance of text mining we will delve further into this in the first half of this particular lecture you will have a lot of theory then we will also get into the python programming part of it okay so you can build chat bots you have chat gpt which is making big rounds Uh, in the world now that's one of the text mining applications okay then you have sentiment analysis so one can build chatbots you can also perform sentiment analysis means by extracting the data from maybe social media from amazon product reviews you can understand how many of your customers are happy how many of your customers are unhappy right if there are movie reviews you can figure out what are the movies uh, which are a super hit what movies did not take off right you can also understand all those kind of aspects and what are the things uh, people are happy about what are the things people are unhappy about when it comes to movie uh, and and bunch of other things you'll be able to figure out we also have something called as machine translation which is also called as language translation okay machine translation or language translation converting one language to another is basically machine translation or language translation named entity recognition means if you have uh, you know huge speech transcript of some ceo or uh, big speech transcripts at a un body united nations then who are the people who have spoken what topics did they talk about what are the names of people what are the names of places what are the names of organizations etc they have spoken about all these things you can extract using named entity recognition it is famously abbreviated as ner named entity recognition tech summarization you know one of my seniors from isb um he is heading the south asia region for this particular book publishing company it's a very big book publishing company and um, they were saying that you know what uh, eventually we have realized that pages were 300 600 500 p uh, uh, books uh, which are uh, uh, having you know 500 600 pages are not catching the attention of the audience people have become so occupied that they don't want to spend so much of time can you do something with this then we figured out that yes we have something called as text summarization wherein it will read all the 600 pages uh, algorithm and it would generate probably 5 6 pages or 10 pages it'll be kind of abstract when you did your projects as part of your graduation you would have worked on projects and in the first page you would have put something called as abstract by reading that abstract you can figure out what people can expect as part of that project right that's text summarization basically 
then you have automatic indexing, right? You can read the entire data, uh, probably 500 pages worth data and automatically create index for that. When people click on that, they go to the relevant portion of that page. Uh, you can extract the information as well. Information, key information. All these are part of name entity recognition. Risk sensing. Uh, there was a project that I've worked on uh, and this was related to Nestle. Nestle is a company and Maggie is one of their products. And a few years back, someone on social media was saying that Maggie is not healthy. It has excess lead content and things of that kind. And trust me, friends, nothing spreads faster than negativity. People will not be bothered about thousand good reviews, but they'll be concerned about one negative review. That's how the human brain is tuned. Okay, it will push us towards that negative zone always. Whatever be it, I will be in negative zone. That's what human brain usually does. So given this, companies find it very difficult to survive and sustain because one negative thing, even people who were regularly consuming Maggie were like, yeah, it's very dangerous. Then why were you consuming Maggie daily for your breakfast? For years together and nothing happened. Someone posted some negative tweet and then all of a sudden your health uh, wasn't doing well, wasn't keeping well, right? And all those people also started building on top of that. And over a period of time, it snowballed into a big issue and Nestle had to shut down Maggi in India. And then slowly they had to prove to the regulatory bodies that it's as healthy as ever. And then again, production started. But if organizations can sense these risks on an ongoing basis, and the project that I was involved in for this exact customer, and uh, we were continuously extracting the data from Facebook, continuously we were extracting data from Twitter and from other sources. And every day, once in 24 hours, we used to send them some word clouds, which you'll understand later and some kind of reports which would help them understand whether uh, the sentiment is positive throughout or was there any negative sentiment creeping in. If there's a negative sentiment, the senior leadership of that company would then read those comments and figure out whether those comments are uh, worthy to be responded to or not. They can release a press, uh, you know, they can do a PR event, right? They can do some kind of a press release and say that, don't you worry, here is a proof. Someone is trying to uh, resort to malified, uh, you know, acts. You, you can trust on this data is what your senior leadership can always say. You can look at the news articles. You can analyze the news articles. And then based on that sentiment, whether people are talking positive uh, things or negative things or neutral things, based on that, you can predict whether the stock value will move up or come down. Okay, that's called a stock market prediction. You all would have seen Gmail, obviously, right? In that, you also have spam folder. The moment uh, someone reads at the subject of the email and the body of the email and the signature, yeah, they can figure out whether it is spam or not. And algorithms were built on those lines. So that's again unstructured textual data, emails. You need to do text mining, bring it into some kind of a structured format, and then you can predict whether that email is spam or ham. Ham means not spam, not hamburger. Yeah, ham means it's not spam. Okay. So within text analytics, you have text mining and NLP. Text mining means order of the words is important. For example, if there's a sentence, the mad dog bit Sharon. In text mining, the sequence of the words is not important. The is one token, one word. Sharat is another token or word. Dog is another token or word. Bit is another token or word. Mad is another token or word, right? Um, you know what, when I've used this example, Sharat was like so furious. He told, 
i will take my revenge i will put somewhere else the mad barney bit dog so something in this place i don't know <laughs> you're not doing that it will i'll give that as an example fine so sharath is my colleague at office and is one of the senior data scientists and uh, trainers uh, that that uh, we have yeah okay anyways so the point that i'm trying to drive is if you have a sentence if the sequence of the words doesn't matter then it's called as text mining if the sequence of the words matter then it's called as nlp when the sequence of words is considered it adds meaning okay it really adds meaning there are a few terminologies that we need to be aware of we have a terminology called as lexicon a lexicon is like a dictionary but it contains vocabulary of person language branch of knowledge for example if you have all the medical terms in one place that would be called as one lexicon like medical dictionary and the terms that you have in that dictionary right is called as lexemes and lexicons are domain specific you can have life sciences healthcare related lexicon you can have finance related lexicon you know you can have different industries related lexicons and there are three famous lexicons which exist one is called as bing when you use this it would you know map your textual data each and every word it will map with the data which bing lexicon has its collection of words and it will classify which of the words are positive and which of the words are negative we also have a lexicon called as afin okay that also has bunch of english words it will look at all the different words that your textual data has and it will compare it with the words that afin lexicon has and then it will give a score zero means neutral if you have a word called good it's positive but if you have a word called brilliant it's better than good so it will have higher valence score valence means sentiment score if someone says your training is bad barani there'll be a negative valence score for that if someone says boss your training is worse then it will have a negative value which is which will be closer to minus 5 right depending on the words and who has given all those valence scores people english pundits english gurus english um scholars for every word they have given uh, these kind of things if there are 10 people then all these 10 english scholars would be given a word they will be asked to rate that by giving a number on how positive or how negative or is it a neutral word and then you average these values of all the 10 people and assign one value so that's how um you know these uh, scores for each and every word are predetermined then you have something called as nrc which is also a lexicon it has eight emotions okay it has eight uh, different emotions which are crowd source annotations I mean you just ask your people everyone just to give some notation to each and every word or some annotation to each and every word and then for every word uh, they were asked to do a classification such as whether it is anger related word or fear related anticipation trust related surprise so on and so forth those are lexicons and you have something called as phoneme which is speech sounds okay made by the mouth and you can differentiate one word for another for example ka right in car you have ka right it's not c it's ka and uh, grapheme is group of letters okay of either size one or multiple that represent individual sounds or these are nothing but phonemes only but it can also have group of words like s spoon you pr pronounce this right that that sound comes right u 
right? It's not O, it's U, N, in that way, right? The pronunciation is equal. Morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit in the language. If you have a word called as unbreakable, then un is one word, break is another word, and able is a third word. So that's unbreakable. You divide. Smallest unit which makes sense. Then you have homograph. Homograph means two words which are spelled the same, but they sound different and also have different meaning. For example, let's wind up the session. W-Y-N-D, you're pronouncing it as wind. Wind is heavy. Same word. But you, I mean, it, when you spell it, it sounds different and it has different meaning as well. Lead the team. Being the manager, lead the team. This is lead metal. Lead lead. Ways, right? Those are called as homographs. Then we also have homopheme. When you have two words that sound the same, but if they are spelled differently and have different meaning, then they are called as homopheme. For example, they sound the same, okay? Pay is a tasty fruit. Pay of shoes. Pay your beard. Okay. Right, right. It is spelled differently and also has different meaning. Then you have homonym. Homonym. If you have two words which are spelled the same and sound alike, but they have different meanings. There is a fey for kids. This is a fey deal. He's fey in color. Right? So all of these spell the same. That means written the same. They sound uh, alike. But they have different meanings. Then we need to be extremely cautious about punctuation marks. Before that, yeah, lexicons are like dictionaries. They are already available in your Python libraries. You need to just install the relevant Python library and use it, right? So when we get into the practicals, hands-on using Python, we'll look into those aspects. Look at these two words, friends, or, or sentences rather. Men, cooler. Punctuation marks are extremely important, right? A woman without her man is nothing. But if you say women colon, the same sentence with change in punctuation marks. A woman means a woman is saying this. Without her, man is nothing. So instead of comma, if you replace it with colon, and instead of comma after man, if you put it after her, the entire meaning changes. Right, so punctuation marks are very important. Most of the times, as part of your data cleansing, all these punctuation marks are removed and thrown away. But they are, they they add value. Okay, when you do natural language processing, even more. Let's eat, grandpa. Versus, let's eat, grandpa. Let's eat, grandpa means, let us kill and eat, grandpa, like wrong turn movie, where people eat humans. Right. Probably the people in wrong turn might say this. Let's say grandpa for fun today, right? We had enough of uh, sheep and goat and hen. Let's eat grandpa. <laughs> That's the meaning that this gives. Let's eat, comma. Just the introduction of that comma will change the meaning, right? You're, you're asking your grandpa, grandfather to eat. You're saying, come, let's both of us eat in that day. We are going to learn to cut and paste kits. Comma here clearly emphasizes that you are asking the kids to, I mean, you are telling to the kids that today you are going to learn how to cut and paste. But if you remove that comma, entire meaning changes. So you have to be very cautious. Okay. All right. So having said this, now let's get into a few other discussion points. 
avenues of textual unstructured data.